Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Building HVAC Science. In today's episode, Eric and I speak with Steve Byers, a friend of mine from Energy Logic in Colorado. Steve runs a company that is a HERS rater and provider. And I wasn't sure that everyone in our network that listens to most of our podcasts knows actually what the Home Energy Rating System is, H-E-R-S, HERS. Steve talks about his background, his company, and he talks about the challenges faced by energy raters, particularly in the field of new construction. We also talk about the interface between HVAC standards, HVAC contractors, and the commissioning process, as well as how that works alongside raters and home energy ratings. So hopefully this is an informative episode for those of you not familiar with ResNet and the HERS rating system. Steve is a great, well-versed, successful business person running a great company out there in Colorado, but also with offices in Hawaii that does HERS ratings. In any case, take a listen to this episode with Steve Byers of Energy Logic talking about building better homes, bridging the gap between energy ratings and HVAC. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Eric Kaiser here, Bill Spohn right over there. And with us today, special guest, Mr. Steve Byers from Energy Logic in Colorado. Welcome, Steve. Thanks. Really glad to be here. Thanks for coming on, Steve. We've known each other for quite a while. And I think, Eric, you just met Steve recently. I just met Steve for the first time today. Okay. <laughs> I haven't run into him at an event yet, so I'm sure we will sooner or later. Exactly. Yeah. I'd like, Steve, for you to give your background. How we know each other is through ResNet, basically. But also, we have a common mutual friend, Peter Trost. So we hang around together at different events and things like that. And also Peter Kreisha, another friend there. And we actually had a little group going there for a while. But give the listeners who aren't familiar with ResNet and perhaps what you do, what you do and what your firm does. So company Energy Logic, we're Colorado and Hawaii based. We've been doing Energy Logic has existed since January 1, 2006. We work all of the front range of Colorado up into the mountains, a little bit of Wyoming. And then of course we have the Hawaii branch to so work all the islands of Hawaii. What we do in the core of the business is still energy ratings. So we've diversified the company quite a bit. We do a lot of sustainability work. We are doing some commercial work. We do a lot of multifamily work, but single family ratings and program compliance, that's really still the foundation of the company. And when I say program compliance, I'm talking about things like Energy Star, DOE Zero Energy Ready, all the programs that we all know and love. That's the core of the company. My background is solid training in history, which is a great segue into building science. So... So we don't repeat those things of the past, right? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. If that was true, I'd probably be out of a job, but we keep doing it. So I started out, I'm not going to give you my full life story, but kind of relevant. I started out as an intern at South Face Energy Institute back in 1993. So I had a couple of icons of the industry who are retired, semi-retired, Dennis Creech and Jeff Tiller. Shout out to those guys. I owe them a lot for ushering me into this industry, which has been the work of a lifetime. And though it's never easy, I'm always super grateful that I found my way into this. Real simple question. Why does a company like yours need to exist? That's a great question, actually. I'll try to give a somewhat succinct answer. The nature of construction, and we've done a lot of existing home work too, but since the company's really new construction now, the nature of construction, especially now, and this has been a continuous trend since I started, is that the people building the homes. And I'm talking about really the people on the ground, whether they're called project managers or site supers. There's myriad terms for the person who's actually there checking in on the house, making sure that things got done and done right. Their primary focus, understandably, is not on the things that we're focused on. It's not on energy efficiency, comfort, sustainability. That's not their game. Their job is to get a house built. It's not that they don't care about it. It's just that that's not the focal point for them. Much the same as it's not really the focal point for code officials, who we all know they start with health and safety, and that's good and right. So there's this play, there's this gap around quality assurance, quality control, both components of what we do for us to play, where we want to make sure that the way the homes are being built is going to ensure you know, the least amount of energy use, the most comfort, resilience, sustainability, all of those. That's the niche, that's the role that an energy rater ought to be playing in the construction process. 
something just occurred to me. If you consider houses as being built or manufactured, it's one of very few products that actually aren't built in a factory. Yeah, although we're getting there to some degree. But yeah, true. Where there isn't the quality control aspect is usually in the factory, somehow either in line or in inspection or receiving or output or that kind of thing. So your company exists to provide quality control for new construction of homes and buildings. That's the way that we see it. Whether our clients see it that way or not is an open question. Some do, some don't. Some see us as, quite frankly, a necessary evil. We need you for code compliance. We need you to comply with this program and get Energy Star. Fair enough. That's fine. We see ourselves, and yes, we do that, but we see ourselves in that quality assurance light. And just to touch back on that arc of what's happened in the industry, too, when I was actually dragging a blower door around the field many, many moons ago, the average site super, maybe they were managing 10, 12, 15 houses. That number is way higher now. That number is in the 20s, 30s. I've even heard 40 homes that one person is managing the construction of. If you think about that, that's just astounding. Now, in some ways, that technology has moved us. So the systems that builders have now are so much superior to what we had 20 years ago that that's understandable. We should be able to squeeze more, but that is a lot of pressure and a lot of additional management on the site super. So it speaks to the need to have people like us involved because they're moving fast and they got a lot on their plate. Steve, you said something there a little bit ago that really triggered something in my brain and it makes me question something. You said this is where Raiders ought to be involved. Does that mean that Raiders aren't fully involved with all of the processes you talked about there a lot of times or is that something that occasionally Again, even within our own company, and again, that relationship with our builder partners and clients, some see us as very valuable. Like, oh, this is a person who can help me think through things and find better ways to do the things. Not everything. We're not structural engineers, but the things that we're involved with, okay, we can help there. And then the ones that don't see us that way, we're not going to be able to do as much for them and with them. So to extrapolate, not all raters and rating companies are created equally, and that's okay. There are are raters, and they are very narrowly focused. They do code compliance, and they're really not looking to build the relationship with a builder in the same way that we might be. No, there's the luxury of scale. Our company is large enough to really entertain things that it's hard to do when you're small. I get it. We were small once too, so I totally understand that. And then there's the full spectrum of value add, if you will. Where do you see a lot of homeowners finding value? You talk about the builders, but really these products we're making, whether it be the building, the multifamily, single family, ultimately they're all going to occupants. Those are the ones. Where do you think the occupants are finding value in the services of a raider? Frankly, probably very little because they don't by and large know that we've even been involved. Unless somebody is really paying attention and they're a very unusual, motivated buyer who's really educated about what we do and the fact that we're involved, or the most likely place that an occupant, that a home buyer, a homeowner is going to know that we're even involved is, again, probably via the Energy Star program. Unless they've specifically come to or sought out a builder that is building above code. So I'm building a custom home. I know I want it to be really kick-ass, and I'm looking for that builder that can do that for me, which is not the vast majority of buyers, of course, especially now when we're in this like housing attainability crisis. It's just like, I need a house, and I almost don't care. Yeah, I'd say very few do. And if you think about what is the home buyer exposure to the energy rater? Frankly, none, unless they paid attention beforehand somehow, and they were they noticed us or noticed something involved there. The only place they're for sure going to ever see anything is at closing. (laughs) So you've got documentation of the work we did, or that's a home energy rating certificate or an energy star certification, something like that. And it's in a stack of closing documents, 300 pages deep. I don't think we're getting a lot of attention at that moment in time. Going back, I can remember getting products and I'd see a little tag, a little square tag that says inspected by number nine. You need to start doing that, Steve, on your houses. <laughs> you start leaving these little tags somewhere. We did a little bit and we've done that in the past. We put stick, And I'd still do it in certain contexts. We put stickers up with our number, website, et cetera, just home done by us. 
some build, you know, most builders are fine with that, some aren't. But that's the, it's going to go on the furnace probably somewhere on the plenum. Again, not super high viz. Somebody may just overlook that until there's a problem, probably. Then maybe they're calling us, but odds are they're calling the other sticker that's on there, which is the HVAC company. Let's cross over into that topic. What role does a rater play in the HVAC system, in evaluating the HVAC system? Yeah, again, it's full spectrum. It could be anything from very little, just what's required in resident minimum standards. Here's we look at this. Mechanical system basics, efficiency, size. Where are the ducts? Are they inside or outside the conditioner space? The basics. All the way to companies like ours and some others that are actually doing the design. So we're doing HVAC design, so we're deeply involved in the process. And so then even further, as we've done the design, we're doing the commissioning to different parts of the house here, all the way to the 310 commissioning and whatnot. So it really, again, is a spectrum of involvement for raters and rating companies as to what how embedded they're going to be and what their level of understanding about HVAC performance issues are. And there's terminology you use there, which I want to make sure listeners are aware of. You talked about raters and rating companies, but there's other components of the home energy rating system. Could you talk about that? Sure. Do you mean in terms of providers? and? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Just a primer on how resonance structured, because yes, that's true. All of your listeners don't know that. It's not the water they swim in. Yeah. So our governing body, ResNet, the Residential Energy Services Network, voluntary nonprofit organization that is a standard setting organization for the entire HERS rating industry. So then beneath that, the structure is such that there are providers, and a provider means a HERS provider, Home Energy Rating System provider, and the providers have raters underneath them. So the way that the industry is structured, you can be a provider that there's no firm definition here, but it's like an independent provider. So all of the raters under you are independent entities, and you are their conduit through ratings go from a rater to a provider to the resident registry, which is true regardless or you can be your own provider. So Energy Logic, we are a provider and we are our own provider. We used to provide for other raters in, across the country. We don't do that anymore, but we could. But as it is right now, we are a provider just for ourselves. So all of our raters are in-house, if you will, and the ratings flow through our provider side, which we keep somewhat separate, and then goes to the resident registry. So that's how the industry is structured. So what you can't have, it's important to know, because then this goes to the QA, QC at the industry level. You can't be a lone wolf energy rater out there just going, I'm an energy rater and it's good. You can trust me. No, you've got to be inside the ecosystem or it's not allowed. You're basically committing fraud if you say you're doing an energy rating and you're not inside the resonant ecosystem. Now, that's not, there are ways to comply with code and whatnot that we probably don't want to go down the rabbit hole of a HERS index versus an ERI. That's probably not necessary. It's just another way to comply with code that is built into the code because HERS is a proprietary term and it can't be used in the code. So the ERI was partially created to allow the same methodologies to be applied in code for code compliance via performance path. But that's probably enough detail for here. <laughs> What then, the raters are the ones taking the measurements, looking at all the things in the field. They pass that on to the providers who then review everything and then enter it into the database. That's the overall flow. Yeah. So one more level of structure, just for clarity, there, the entry level to the HERS world is what's called an RFI, a rating field inspector. So most companies use RFIs now. So you become an RFI and then you can gather the data, but you can't interact with the software. So the data's got to go to a rater. The rater can interact with the software, whether that's Ecotrope or RemRater or any of the others. So we use Ecotrope exclusively. So then the rater interacts with the energy modeling software, Ecotrope in our case, and then that flows from Ecotrope into the ResNet registry. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. You'd mentioned the commissioning and standard 310 a little bit. What's your company doing, ResNet? It's ResNet, ACCA. ICC? No, it's just ResNet and ACCA. 
Yeah, yeah, it did. Just resident ACA 310 standard. Yes, we are. It's been an extremely painful process <laughs> getting even to the place where we are, which is still to some degree figuring some things out. A little bit of background. So 310, I think everybody's very supportive of what 310 is intending to do and where I think we'll ultimately get. We certainly are, but it's been a tough adoption and execution of it. And partly for us, it was just a little bit of a unique situation. A year and a half ago, we had the Marshall Fire happen here between smaller towns, between Denver and Boulder. And so I'm sure many people are familiar with that. It was a tragedy. Many, many structures were lost and they've had to be rebuilt. But in the process of determining incentives to build back better and whatnot, large rebate incentive funds were tied to getting to Energy Star Next Gen, which is inherently tied to performing standard 310. But the problem was that it really wasn't ready for prime time at that point. It wasn't even released when that was decided. And we and other rating companies in the area had to be the pointy end of the spear going out and beta testing effectively 310 on and on a lot of systems that really, I think 310 didn't really envision so much. So there was a lot of figuring out. We still struggle sometimes with ways to test more esoteric systems via 310. We're getting there. And maybe I'm calling ourselves out a little bit here, but it's been tough. And we've been making our way through it, getting people trained. One of the problems, and this actually can apply to any program, anywhere, when you're going to start a new program and it doesn't have adoption and you've got to get people trained in it. So you train somebody up in whatever, it's 310. And then there's not a 310 test for them to do for months. So by the time they actually get to the point of going out to do it, let's just say things are a little hazier than they were the day after they came out of training. That's an ongoing problem. It's going to resolve itself as 310 becomes more standard as, as we move towards Energy Star Next Gen and whatnot, and we've got more work to be done so you can go through training, you can start doing the testing, and your competency can build up. But it's tough when there's not a lot of work going on, and you've got to train people and try to keep them competent. We're in that process right now of figuring out, okay, we got to keep getting people trained in 310. How do we maintain their competency while we're waiting for there to be enough work to spread across all the staff who've been trained in 310? It's not the most straightforward thing ever. Are there any aspects of 310 which are particularly more challenging, or maybe you're not that close to the action? One of the things has been getting systems into high speed. I know that's one of the bigger challenges. There's some drilling into cabinets, a bit of a challenge there. I mean, that's more of the liability thing. We're always very nervous when we've got to drill cabinets. Again, the watt draw component and just our people are not electricians, they're not HVAC techs. Their comfort level with doing that is low. And well, it depends on the person. Some people are comfortable with it and others not. And that just speaks to like, we can segue into something else a little bit. Like, while there's a real connection and between the rating world and the HVAC world in terms of what we're doing in ratings, raters are not HVAC technicians. And frankly, a lot of the stuff that 310 is doing, even the HVAC installers are not that familiar with really. It's when you get into like, Real HVAC technicians who are there to do warranty, troubleshoot, things like that. That's where we're going to. But we're trying to take raters that have a relatively low understanding of HVAC in general. If you were to look at raider training, and I'm not even, you got to get to raider level RFIs. That's an even lower bar of understanding of what's going of HVAC in general. But when you look at raider training and what's required in raider training, as far as HVAC understanding, it's pretty low. That's not to be dismissive of what's happening in Raider training. That's the way it's built. We're not there to commission systems. That's not part of a rating. Now we're moving into that more. We think about, again, the liability components of a rating company and you're stepping into doing things in a system that we may or may not be insured for, frankly. We're not really supposed to be messing around. Now, we've made sure our company is insured for it, but you're getting a watch draw, you're rooting around inside the cabinet around charged items, and that's a little frightening to some people. And this the skill set's not there, so we're getting there. It's an interesting problem for us as we evolve to being... And again, I think it's good because I believe in what 310 is trying to do in terms of establishing baseline performance and systems as a commissioning component. It's not, it's not everything there is to know about commissioning, but that's a good place to be in terms of commissioning 
residential HVAC system. So I'm glad that we're doing it. It's just not been easy thus far. I got a comment there on that. I think maybe you're selling the Raiders a little short there on that. And yeah, the HVAC's definitely a different skill set for sure. And I speak to that because that was my expertise coming into this is more on the HVAC side. But the Raiders are performing something. They're really commissioning a building like they're making sure the shell of that building is tight. And that's commissioning a system. It's a non-moving system. It's more of a passive static system. But you're still commissioning that and you're still looking for that. So I think there's just different skill sets between the two trades. And now we're having to cross over a little bit more between those because realistically, the two trades, the building shell commissioning, the HVAC commissioning, the HVAC system, the building system, those two work together and they have to work together if we're really going to make people comfortable, which is what I keep going back to. That's the goal of conditioning buildings is we're trying to keep people comfortable and healthy inside of them. Absolutely. I totally agree. The relationship that we have as raiders with HVAC companies is the same thing as builders. Yeah, it's challenging. When it's great, it's really good. And we work together really well. And there's this simpatico, like, hey, we found this problem. And oh, thanks. An HVAC company that's really trying to do their best. And they are happy to have it pointed out before people move in and then have comfort issues and callbacks, which is everybody's nightmare. And then we have quite adversarial relationships sometimes. And then this, whether if, if design is involved, that can be another piece of this. But yeah, for sure. We're commissioning it. This house is a system, right? Let's go back to our tried and true phrase. And it's you know, always going to be true. It is the house is a system. And if the shell's got a problem, then HVAC is going to be challenged. If HVAC's got a problem, comfort's going to be challenged. Now, I wouldn't say almost, regardless of whether, if you build a really fantastic shell, you can cover up a lot of sins on the HVAC side. We all know that. It's not what anybody's designing to do, but we do see better and better shells. We see it on the design side, especially. We're able to bring, the risk is lowered, the system sizes are lower, the overall system efficiency is better and better. And of course, that's where we're trying to drive. Was we're trying to drive towards zero energy, that's the things that have to happen. Conversely, like we can make a really garbage shell pretty darn comfortable with a really good HVAC system. The thing is, it's going to take a lot of horsepower. It's going to take a lot of energy to do that. And it takes a lot of work to do that. So that's where the balance comes in of there really is no free lunch. We're going to use some energy to condition these buildings. We just have to use the least amount possible to make people really comfortable in them. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know anybody who wakes up in the morning and goes, I want to build a house. I want to design a system that uses the most energy possible. Nobody does that. I mean, politics aside, everybody, there's this logic in saying, well, let's spend less money to make people comfortable. And if you don't like the energy side, let's just talk about money. What's new and interesting on the horizon for you from your perspectives? You actually referenced one thing earlier, and maybe I'm just a little focused on it right now because I've been personally working on it, which is modular and offsite construction. Yeah, I did. Been running a working group under the Resonance banner, working to find better ways for us to be doing ratings and getting certifications on modular because it's just a different world. It is plant-based and we're actually not there to see stuff that gets covered up that we normally would see on site. It's not new. So very little, of course, that we ever do is truly new. It's like, oh, that's been around for 20 years. Yeah, it has, but we're only finally really getting to see it in the field. But we are seeing there's a lot of movement, especially again around attainability and the hope and the promise, the panelization, but I'm really focused on volumetric modular, that the promise of volumetric modular is going to help us ultimately bring costs down for getting people into residences. In some cases, that's true. In other cases, it's not true yet. There's so much going on in that world in terms of innovation. I would challenge anyone else to tell me where more is going on in terms of innovation in housing than in the modular offsite world. There's just a ton of interest and energy there, a lot of money flowing into it. So that's pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited about, in terms of innovation technology, things that are happening around heat pumps in particular, and the drive towards electrification, decarbonization, the stuff that I see, mo the interesting things that are happening around new heat pump technologies, solid state, stuff in heat pumps on that i'm right at the edge of my knowledge base here <laughs> so i'm gonna say solid state heat pump stuff that's about as far as i can take it but 
watch a presentation. I'm like, wow, that's really intriguing. Can we get away from refrigerants and go to solid state products that don't have refrigerants? Because things like listening to presentations on a couple of these different systems, and it's fascinating. And I'm like, and you guys aren't even talking about the amount of refrigerant that gets accidentally spilled into the environment via installs and decommissioning systems and whatnot. It's like, wow, you're not even touching on the carbon impact of that and don't know exactly how big it is, but it's meaningful. Our mutual friend, Dan Perunco did a presentation at Raider Fest a couple of years ago about how much he thinks is being spilled. And it was hair raising. No offense, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done raising hair, Steve. Yes. Just industry hairs, but <laughs> right, uh, right. Yeah. That segues into another thing that I really wanted to touch on here, which is Raider Fest. Yeah. That's a thing that I just recently learned about. And tell us a little bit about that. What is it? What goes on at Raider Fest? Yeah, what's well, happening like 10 days from now. So we're in the full scramble mode. And fortunately or unfortunately for this year, registration's closed. But Raider Fest is what it sounds like. It was, God, I think we're in our 18th year or something, or 17th year of Raider Fest, something like that. It is meant to bring together Raiders, but it's not like exclusive to Raiders. We've had existing home people, BPI people come, some builders, some contractors. It's a mix, but it's heavily Raider focused to spend a very, I hesitate to call it unstructured, but it's not formal. We do it in the mountains. We've had a few different venues. We've got a great one. We hit on the formula of, hey, let's look for camps, like summer camp venues where school started. They're not being used. And that's actually worked out great for us. We find these venues, they've got dining halls and sleeping places and people can camp if they want and all everything. And we've experimented with various different formats, but we've been on a single track format for a long time. And part of that was it's simpler, but that was actually the least of it. When you do a single track conference, everybody there heard the same thing. So then everybody in the breaks and around the campfire later on can talk about that same subject. So I think there's a pro there that I really like. And again, it's we call it the unconference. It's fun. But yeah, there's campfires and beer drinking, and then there's Raider Olympics. We can't leave out Raider Olympics, which is always fun. It's a Spartan games for Raiders where you have to set up a blower door and people throw foam blocks at you and all kinds of stuff. And Bill's witnessed this and Bill came to easily, and I hope it's never exceeded the most bizarre Raider Fest ever. In 2013, Bill came out and set up a big test structure for testing pressures and everything. But that was when we had an epic flood here that shut down most of Northern Colorado. And we had to pull, our people were up setting up in the mountains and we're on the phone going, you got to get out of there because all the roads are going to start shutting down. And they're like, Literally, it's like a movie. Like they're getting, it's like, oh, the bridge just shut down behind us and they're going and we're routing people, trying to route people into a re. We had to do this in hours. People were inbound on planes to Raider Fest as this is going down. And we're like, all right, what are we going to do? We don't have a venue. So we're in our little town of Berthet here between Boulder and Fort Collins and call the community center. See if anything's going on. And that's where we had it. So it wasn't the most beautiful venue, but it worked out. We pulled it off. It was a lot of a logistics. And we ended up having a lot of fun, even if it wasn't in the mountains. Yeah, it was really cool. It, it's a great event. September every year? Yeah, it's been September every year. We get a wide variety of speakers talking on all kinds of topics, like Bill is there. We've had Sam Rashkin, a whole bunch of different people. Program people come in. We always would like to have them come in so they can really sit talk again informally, talk about their program, hear from Raiders. If you're the Energy Star program or IP or Water Sims, they've all been to Raider Fest and gotten to hear the good, bad, and ugly about their programs directly from people in the field, which is great because it's one thing to hear it from me. And it's another thing to hear it from an RFI trying to execute on their program in the field. So all those things. And we try to, we always look, we're recruiting people so if you're out there and you think you'd like to be at Raider Fest and got something cool to talk about, let me know. Because I just want, we never say, oh, here's the topic. Here's the theme. Okay, stick to the theme. No, it's like, I want to invite smart, interesting, excited people to come to Raider Fest and talk about what excites them. That's the topic I want to hear. I want to hear about what fires you up, not what you think is going to get you through the gauntlet of 
session suggestions or session uh, selections. You mean AI doesn't do the screening for you? No, 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 no. no. Alan Iverson? No, I don't have him. (laughs) No, we pretty much, if somebody proposes something and we're like, "Mm, I don't know, then we'll work with that and tweak that. But that's pretty rare, really. Like you invite smart, engaged people. They've got things to say that don't necessarily really fit. And I'm not bagging on the other conferences. You run a big formal conference. You should be looking at everything and saying, no, this is the track you're in. needs to be there. I understand that. I'm not dismissing that at all. This is just, we try to do something a little different that can be a little more free. There's a risk. It could be like, oh, that really didn't go over, but that's okay. What's the best way for someone to keep tabs with that? If you're interested in speaking, it's just to email me. And I don't know if you'll put that in show notes or... I will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd be best. We've been doing it for... Have no intention of not doing it. So we'll keep doing it. And for our... One of the reasons we started is like sending all of our field staff to a big conference is actually really expensive. And it may or may not be great for them. So if you're a new... RFI or relatively new Raider and you go to ResNet, yeah, sort of, kind of, but it's not really what you need in a lot of ways. And that's not to say you shouldn't never go to ResNet, but I think it's better for people who've got a few years under them as a Raider or starting to be a manager in a rating company. Definitely, if you run a rating company, you should be a ResNet. I can't even imagine not being there. For a newish field person who really needs more technical support and needs to feel the love and maybe hear some other things that are a little broader, I like to also make Raider Fest about, like, why do we do this? Why do we do this work writ large? Yeah, I mean, for some people, it may be a paycheck, but for others of us, it goes far beyond a paycheck. Excellent. What a great way to wrap up your thinking there. It's about the passion. Any closing thoughts for our hybrid audience of HVAC and building performance professionals? I'm sure. I think just to go back to what we touched on, I mean, there's so much opportunity for us to work together and to fight less, communicate more. So often we find it comes down to communication. We didn't communicate well. The HVAC company didn't communicate well. Oh, the builder didn't communicate to either of us or vice versa. There's I swear, and you guys, but you run a business, you're probably 80% of our problems come down to a communication failure of some sort. So yeah, let's do that. Let's communicate and collaborate better. And ultimately, we'll be part of the solution and and help and build better, more comfortable, more efficient, more sustainable homes. And that's what we need. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. It was fun. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Building HVAC Science. You know, it's our goal to create better, more knowledgeable HVAC and building performance technicians by helping the professions better understand each other and work together. So that's what we're trying to do here. And hopefully this little slice of information from Steve Byers at Energy Logic helped you along in that journey. I also host the Res Talk podcast, R-E-S-T-A-L-K. And you can find out more about that by going to resnet.us, R-E-S-N-E-T, US. If you have any questions or wish to suggest a topic, reach out to us at marketing at truetechtools.com, T-R-U-T-E-C-H-T-O-O-L-S.com. If you're in the market for any tools or test instruments we mentioned in our podcast, or just in general, take a look at what we offer at truetechtools.com. Full disclosure, I'm a co-owner of TrueTech. And that's T-R-U-T-E-C-H-T-O-O-L-S.com. And you can use the off code HVACBS for a nice discount. As always, thank you for listening to and hopefully following the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Until next time, take care.